Great, thanks a lot and thanks for coming everyone. So, um, so just a very quick bit of background. This really is uh, a work in progress uh, based on the April legislative elections in Indonesia when I was part of a, a, a research project that involved about 50 local researchers in Indonesia. We were working with uh, Gajah Mada, University of Yogyakarta, who were distributed across 20 locations, um, 20 electoral uh, constituencies, uh, looking at electoral campaigning in, in general, but patronage distribution in particular. Um, pork barrel, club goods, and other forms, uh, much wider than vote buying, actually, although this, uh, this talk I'll talk mostly about uh, vote buying. And this particular project is in turn a part of a bigger comparative project looking at such matters uh, across Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines, as well as Indonesia, with a number of uh, colleagues, both from the region and from the US and uh, Australian institutions as well. Now, it so happened uh, that uh, during this research project that uh, a number of our researchers who were uh, located in two electoral districts in Java uh, happened to get really fantastic access uh, to vote buying networks. Um, candidates talked extremely openly about how they organised uh, vote buying uh, and our researchers and including myself when uh, I was there at, the right, at some of the right times uh, were able to witness the process uh, firsthand. So it's the first time I'm aware uh, that researchers have had this sort of access to vote buying um, and how it's organised in Indonesia, though it's been observed in similar ways uh, in some other countries, including uh, Thailand and, and Taiwan. Uh, just the background, uh, the electoral system is an open list uh, proportional representation system. So uh, candidates uh, in the national uh, um, uh, parliament, the DPR it's called, uh, run in multi-member districts, three to ten members in one uh, district, and there are 12 parties. Um, and the party, each party can nominate up to the total number of seats uh, in each constituency. Uh, and individual voters can vote um, either for a party or an individual candidate of their choice, um, and then the, the, the votes for the party and the individuals, all the individuals from that party are, are added up. If the, the total is enough to uh, be allocated one seat, then it's the individual with the highest personal vote uh, who gets the seat. Um, so this has given rise uh, to an extremely personalised form of election campaigning in the parliamentary elections. Very individualised. Uh, form of campaigning, and we know from the comparative literature this is particularly conducive uh, to vote buying. There's also three levels uh, of uh, elections running, running simultaneously. So the People's Representative Council, the DPR, nationally, uh, and then regional councils at both uh, the provincial and the district level. There's about 34 provinces, there, there are 34 provinces in Indonesia, and about 500 uh, districts. Uh, so, oops. so the main area I'm going to be talking about today is this um, uh, Central Java Electoral District Number Three, uh, which um, uh, also which incorporates the uh, four uh, Kabupaten or districts of Blora, Grobogan, Pati, and and Rembang. Uh, in Java, the uh, boundaries of national and provincial electoral election districts are the same. Um, so this, is also, this also doubles as the uh, electoral district uh, for the provincial parliament. But then each of those four districts has its own parliament. And each of those districts then has several different electoral districts uh, within them. Um, uh, so basically, um, well, I won't go through the, the maths, but each uh, voter had the choice of voting for three candidates at the three different levels from about um, 300 or so total candidates at all those levels. So extreme, uh, 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 very high degree of uh, choice. Um, vote buying. Almost every serious candidate that we inter interviewed distributed cash to voters here. Um, in the few days leading up to the poll, the polls. 
um, uh, you know, some candidates, especially those who have a low location on the party list, are not that serious. They don't have a lot of money, they don't have really serious ambitions to be elected, so some of them didn't bother. In fact, they hardly campaigned at all. But almost, I think it's the case in this, in that particular electorate anyway, every serious candidate we talked to uh, distributed cash. Um, uh, and so what we're talking about here is vote buying very narrowly defined, distribution of cash or goods to individual voters in the few days leading up to the elections. As I said before, can candidates do a lot of other sorts of uh, patronage politics. For example, they distribute what's, what's often known as club goods, uh, um, collective you know, donations to the community, say to repair a mosque, for example, is a classic. Um, or to uh, repair a bridge in the village, or they give a donation to a co local community group. So I'm not even going to really be talking about that. I'm talking about individualised uh, payments. Um, they use a lot of different terms to, ex uh, to describe um, uh, this practice. The most common in Indonesia is Serangan Fajar, which means the dawn attack. It's sort of a term that's borrowed from Indonesia's revolutionary history, but in fact, a lot of the time it's not done at dawn. It's often, um, uh, uh, it is sometimes done early morning on the day of the vote, but often it's done in a few days before that. Other terms, execusi or execution, bomb is another um, common, uh, a common uh, one. So the puzzle here, of course, it's the classic puzzle of vote buying. Um, so there's a typical uh, definition, exchange of money, goods or services um, uh, for a vote. But the problem is the form of exchange, especially in conditions in which you have a secret ballot, is not enforceable. That's the problem uh, with vote buying. It's not like buying uh, something and at a shop. So how and why? So almost all the literature we see on vote buying um, uh, tries to wrestle with this basic conundrum. Uh, if it's not uh, legally enforceable, how and why does it work, or indeed does it really work? Um, and the literature suggests um, uh, several different explanations. One, for example, that's uh, arisen especially out of the Latin American literature is that we often think of this as vote buying, but in fact it's often turnout buying. That is, parties are distributing money to loyalists, people who are inclined to vote for the party anyway, just to ensure they go to the polling booth. Um, there's also a lot of literature, especially a lot of anthropological literature, uh, which sees this not as a form of commodity exchange, but more as a form of gift exchange. And that vote buying works, according to this sort of literature, because it's embedded in social networks and social norms to do uh, with reciprocity um, and so on. So we'll be looking at that in a little bit. Another explanation is that vote buying might not actually win you an election, it's just like an entry ticket. It just makes you a serious candidate. Um, and interestingly, I mean, one of the, this is just an aside, but one of the interesting things about this research is how the candidates often speak as if they'd read the social science literature on the topic. They often use a lot of exactly these terms, and one of the ones was an entry ticket. I mean, some of the candidates did talk about vote buying in that, in that, in that term. The other explanation, of course, um, which remind me if I don't come back to this, is that often... Uh, uh, in some um, accounts of vote buying in, in different places, uh, there's a lot of attention uh, placed on whether the, the, the ballot is really secret or not. You know, you can enforce it if you know whether the person who received the money um, received uh, actually ended up voting for you or not. So uh, I'm going to quickly whip through these questions um, uh, uh, just as different sorts of ways of getting at this big major puzzle. Um, so what are the structures that the politicians we came across, what, what do they, how do they distribute the cash? Um, and uh, how do they engage in vote buying? Is that, is that part of the key? How do they target voters? Is the swing uh, versus loyalist issue important, like it is sometimes thought to be uh, in other settings? How do they determine what, when, how, to, to distribute payments, what's the sort of language that uh, accompanies uh, these mm -hmm. transactions. Um, sorry, everyone can just turn their phones off. Um, 
so what is the sort of language, how are the payments presented to vote, votings, and finally, how do uh, politicians or how do the candidates try to minimise the risks of wastage, of non-delivery uh, as they go about um, uh, this process? How do they ensure people don't renege? So very quickly on the structures uh, that politicians construct in order to get, engage um, in vote buying. Basically, it's a classic brokerage pyramid, just a really classic sort of clientelist uh, pyramid. Um, uh, almost with the vast majority of candidates, they're going outside of their party structures to build these sorts of uh, uh, structures. It's only usually the first or second ranked um, candidates on the party ticket who happen to be the local party chairperson who will go through the party. Um, mostly uh, other candidates will go outside of the party. Um, and they will usually uh, uh, enlist uh, people they know and trust, friends, business associates, people they'll know through some social organisation who will then in turn recruit people below. So this is just a single line, but you should think of this as a really um, a very rapidly diversifying uh, pyramid. So a candidate will appoint someone, usually quite a close friend, as a sub-district coordinator, and there will probably be seven or eight of them, who will in turn recruit village level coordinators. Um, and then underneath them you get the grassroots uh, brokers, they're known in, in, um, in this particular area um, by the Javanese term um, sabet. Um, and it's these people at the grass, the very grassroots, who play the critical role. So their task, the numbers vary, but usually they're recruiting something from five to fifteen voters each. Um, um, and uh, what they do is they uh, collect the details of these individuals. They write them down on a list. Every candidate who engages in vote buying uses this system. Uh, usually the uh, English language term is used for this, by name, by address. So they'll write a list with the person's, it varies a bit, their name, sometimes their telephone number, sometimes their ID number, certainly the basics of their address and so on. And then the lists get handed up, back through the chain and compiled um, at the central level. And then that list is then, and the same structure is then used to distribute <coughs> uh, the payments. Um, uh, for candidates running for the, the larger national or provincial constituency, the, the, the final list that can be compiled are huge. One candidate we had, we had, he, we met had 300,000 names on his list. It was a whole cupboard uh, like this. Um, each who was getting uh, small payments distributed um, uh, this way. Um, uh, we've also got this is just an aside. It's something we're working on. We managed to get. Um, uh, quite a few lists ourselves from the, uh, from the candidates and we're using them to run surveys of voters and of, and of brokers and to do focus group discussions, but that's still uh, work in progress. You've got a about list with about 100,000 names on them. Um, but you can imagine if each candidate is kind of trying to construct these sorts of brokerage pyramids, uh, there's a huge amount of competition and overlap um, at the grass roots. A lot of candidates are not only co competing for the voters, but they're also competing uh, for brokers um, at, at, at the grassroots. And individuals, especially individuals with social influence in a village, are getting approaches from multiple candidates. Um, and that's a lot of the sources of the problems in this process um, arise from there. Um, how are we going for time? All right. Which uh, voters to target? So a lot of the literature in recent years has focused on this, I this issue. One of, the, one of the issues here, um, especially arising from um, the Latin America literature, um, focuses on this question, are uh, candidates, as I said before, uh, uh, is it really vote buying or is it turnout buying? Are you trying to influence someone's choice or are you simply trying to get them to the polls so they'll vote how they would anyway? Um, uh, the problem with this, and a lot of the literature comes out of Latin America, is that it assumes party-based voting, and it assumes it's the party machine that's mobilising uh, people uh, who have themselves strong party identifications. Um, 
the problem with this sort of uh, in analysis in the Indonesian context at least uh, is that although parties sort of still count in legislative elections, it is now a really very heavily candidate-centred electoral system. And the vast bulk of election campaigning, and in particular vote buying, um, is, is, is candidate-centred, is organised and run by individual candidates um, on their own behalf. They're not trying to mobilise a party vote, they're trying to mobilise an individual vote, because often what they're most concerned about is not necessarily the overall vote for their party, but whether they personally will get a larger personal vote than the, their inner party rivals, because that's what's going to um, uh, get them a seat. <coughs> it's, it's critical for getting them a seat, at least. Um, so it is true that some of the candidates uh, we, um, we met said that they would they would target areas that traditionally had been seen as base areas for their own particular party. Um, this is associated in particular with, in Indonesia, what's known, those of you who are familiar with Indonesia will know about Aliran voting, the, these political, kind of social political streams that have been very important um, in, uh, uh, in Indonesian politics, particularly between pious Muslims and um, and uh, non-pious or Abangan Muslims. That was certainly important there, so you could see a sort of a general alignment of uh, socio-religious identities. Um, but basically, uh, because candidates are um, uh, building personal campaign teams and they're building the, those campaign teams on the basis of personal relationships and loyalties, uh, what we see here really is a pattern not so much of party loyalty but clientivist loyalty. So uh, candidates, in other, other words, target areas where they think they personally will have a strong um, voter base. And usually, nine, times ca ca nine cases out of ten, that is again related to patronage politics. But the other sorts of, the broader, more collective forms of patronage politics I was talking about. It's most obvious for incumbents, so people who are already holding seats in the local parliaments, will often have had access to constituency development funds. These are funds that individual, ca individual members of uh, parliament get allocated for small-scale infrastructure or development projects in the villages. So the idea is you spend your five years in parliament bringing development projects to a particular village, you get known there as someone who's, you know, fixed the bridge or, or built the mosque or, um, or, or, you know, got the new irrigation canal dug by delivering that project and then you then consider that your personal base area and then you hit it uh, with vote buying during the election to reinforce that uh, more collective form of patronage. If you, it's harder if you're not an incumbent, but for the interest of time, I won't go into that. What, when, and how much to give? Um, uh, cash or goods? So many candidates, uh, especially first-time candidates, will, will combine their individual vote-buying efforts with collective donations of the, sorts of, of the sort I've been talking about. Um, but when it comes to the approach to uh, voting day itself, almost all use cash. And I guess it's just si similar to why, you know, cash replaced, you know, barter in the economy. It's just much easier to organise and much easier uh, to coordinate. There was one individual candidate in the... Um, in the district of Pati, who was the head of a local party there, and he was famous for distributing rice because he was a rice trader, he was a rice wholesaler. Um, but um, it was a big hassle for him because, you know, if you're delivering several tonnes of rice, you know, it's a, big, um, it's a big job, you've got trucks, and it's just a lot harder to organise. Um, uh, and other candidates sort of mocked him for that. They said, you know, you give people two dollars worth of rice and they're not going to view it in the same way as they would cash anyway. Um, when to give, uh, so most opt for cash. Uh, when to give, uh, basically you give it late but not too late. So 
there's a strong view amongst candidates uh, that voters will often vote for the candidate who gave them the money last, because it's freshest in their memory. Whether it's true or not, I mean, that, that's, it, we, we don't really know, but that certainly is a widespread uh, idea. Um, but the problem is, of course, that again, it's, you know, when you're distributing cash through this huge network of hundreds of brokers, it's, again, it's quite technically quite difficult. Um, if you leave it too late, uh, you can just get out of control and a lot of the money can go missing um, and it can be ineffective. So usually uh, some people do it, very, a few still do it on the morning of the vote, uh, mostly the day before or two or three days leading up to the vote. Um, and there's a bit of variation about that. How much to give? Um, there's real strong patterns here. Um, and the key, uh, really um, consistent pattern we found uh, was that the larger the consti constituency size, so the, the higher the total number of votes you needed, so what we're talking about here are the national and provincial candidates, um, because to get elected to, to get a, um, a national or provincial seat, you needed something like 60 to 100,000 personal votes there, whereas it was possible to get a district seat with a tenth of that. Um, so the payments that were made by the national and provincial candidates were smaller, much smaller. Um, um, let me remember, let me just try and remember. So in, in uh, the sort of averages for district level candidates, that's the smaller constituencies, was something like 30 to 50,000 rupee, so about three to five dollars uh, per voter for a can single candidate. Um, whereas uh, for a national uh, candidate, it was something like 10 to 20,000, so one to two dollars. Candidates would often team up in doing vote buying. So um, the phrase for this is tandem. Um, uh, uh, so a provincial candidate, a DPR candidate, a national candidate and a district candidate would get together and share costs. Um, a lot of our researchers managed to sit in on a lot of these meetings where they debated how much that they would share. And again, the pattern was the same, that typically uh, the district candidates, just because they were distributing to a, a much smaller number of voters, uh, were paying uh, 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 several times, uh, well, usually dark, two to three times more. Um, there was also regional variation. Um, uh, for example, I didn't show you the map, but in the East Java constituency we, we were looking at, uh, the going price was something like twenty to twenty-five thousand, so two to two dollars fifty uh, in the rural areas, but about double that in the towns. So the towns uh, there were more expensive. Um, for some reason, I'm not exactly. We haven't worked this out yet. Um, Rambang, which is on the coast, was about double the average cost of Pati, which was inland. Um, 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 so. The other thing which we should say was that um, there was also quite a bit of variation between candidates. Uh, several, uh, could be, you know, uh, several orders of uh, magnitude. Uh, um, and sometimes one or two wealthy candidates uh, in a particular electoral constituency, it seemed, could really drive the price up. Because candidates seem to be really market sensitive, and they talked about this, they talked about the market price how you had to keep an eye on the market price as you get closer um, to uh, election day. Uh, and some were um, um, increasing their price right up to the eve of uh, voting day. Um, how are payments pre presented? You know, so this is this kind of the anthropological, how do you enforce it? Well, you embed the gift in these kind of reciprocal relationships of of uh, gift giving and mutual obligation and so on. Um, so social meaning of the payment. Um, I mean, let me, let me see. Um, one of the interesting things here is that there are different languages which are used. If you talk to the candidates themselves uh, in an interview situation, they're extremely hard-nosed and economic in the sort of language they use. They talk about things like market price, the transactional character of um, the electorate. Um, uh, they talk of this about investment, rates of return <coughs> on investment, all this kind of terminology that's borrowed uh, from economic life. 
Um, but at the point of exchange, it's much more likely to be a language of gift giving and of charity in particular. So this uh, uh, phrase, tadakah, in particular, which is sort of um, charitable donations in Islam, uh, was often used. Um, uh, and um, the conceit was uh, that, tip, that money would be given uh, to people to compensate them for the time lost uh, to go to the polling booth. So the, I mean, in fact, it's often, you know, it doesn't take you very long at all to go to the polling booth and you're not going to lose a la day's labour. Um, but there's, op there's this conceit that the payment should be more or less equivalent to a day's labour in the rice fields or, or whatever the um, standard sort of work is uh, where the vote buying is going on. Um, where are we? Have I covered most of that? Um, but there is, at the same time, so there is this sort of um, idea on the one hand amongst um, many voters uh, that um, uh, giving money is a sign that someone is a charitable or generous person, and that's an attribute one would expect uh, with, uh, to be associated with wealth and leadership within uh, local society. Um, so if you're a candidate who distributes cash, it's like you're the local um, cloves wholesaler who gives generously um, every time uh, at, uh, at, uh, to charity at the time of the fasting month or whatever. But on the, at the same time, this is often combined amongst voters um, with a view that uh, politicians are all corrupt anyway, so why shouldn't we just take whatever we can uh, from them? So there's a lot of things going on there, um, and we're trying to sort through some of this with some of our um, surveys and some experiments and so on. Uh, the final issue, uh, and this, this is my last slide, I think, um, is how to minimise wastage. And this is really the strong, um, really, really strong impression and really strong finding uh, that... Uh, is, is perhaps the thing which will remain uh, most with me from doing this research is how unreliable this is as a strategy and how risky it is actually and how so many candidates go into it um, uh, feeling very confident, with, confident about their strategy that they've got a good team, they've mapped out where their areas of support are they've uh, accumulated a large sum of money and many of them even for a district parliament seat are spending about fifty thousand fifty to a hundred thousand dollars on this or sometimes more um, uh, and um, they still don't get elected um, um, and they use another term derived from English uh, for this uh, margin error um, which basically means the gap between the number of names on your list and your final vote. And um, many can most candidates found their margin error, so the wastage was 50 to 80%. So you could distribute uh, 12,000 envelopes, the money usually goes out in envelopes, and only get back two or 3,000 votes. <coughs> um, um, and most um, uh, candidates who lost made an error here. They miscalculated the margin error. They did it on the basis of um, the 2009 election, but the margin error almost doubled this election because the, it seems the intensity of vote buying um, had increased a lot. There are two sources of this margin error that um, uh, candidates will talk about. One is unreliable voters, i.e. voters who receive money but don't reciprocate uh, with a vote. Um, um, and it seems here, I mean, there's many, there's a lot of discussion amongst candidates about this, um, but one of the real challenges here was um, uh, just the intensity of the practice meant, meant that many households received multiple payments. Um, one candidate, for example, said that in his particular dis, uh, electoral constituency, uh, he, there were about 65,000 voters, and he thought there were two to 300,000 envelopes of cash uh, circulating. Um, and the response sometimes, and here again there's a lot of debate about if you receive more than one envelope, what do you do? Do you vote for the person who gave it to you last, the person who gave it to you first, the person you like the most, most is it the person who gave you the most money? Um, but what often seems to be the case is that a household will split its vote. 
So you'll try and you'll take candidates from, f you take money from four candidates, mum will vote for one, dad will vote for the second, and so on. Um, and that seems to, that it seems to be like a, a kind of a fair response to many uh, voters. But the other side, the other problem here too is the brokers um, that, remember these, these huge teams are being built and many, it's not only the candidates who are receiving multiple offers, many, oftentimes the brokers are as well. So, um, because the candidates are trying to target people who have influence uh, in the village and so you can get offers and often um, brokers are working for more than one candidate um, at the same time. Many are receiving money and not passing it on. Um, or they're skimming off a large amount of the money that goes through their hands and, and so on. Um, uh, there's a lot of, I, I, I know I've run out of time, there's a lot of monitoring and enforcement methods that uh, candidates um, try to create in order to get around these problems. Um, but even the candidates we met who, had, who were most confident in the scientific character of their vote buying, um, for example, that they would multiple checks of the names of their list, they would do random sampling of the people on their list to ensure that the brokers really had talked to them, uh, and so on and so forth. Even many of them uh, failed to get elected just because they had uh, uh, underestimated uh, the sums uh, that were going to be distributed in their district or they uh, got the margin error wrong. Um, so there's really a critical question here about um, the, the role played by brokers uh, in all of this. Um, so that's it. So that's where it stands uh, at this stage. As I said, very much a work in progress. The, these, each of these main uh, slides I've gone through on the different topics will potentially uh, be a, a, an article um, of its own, basically. Um, uh, but that's where we are at the moment. So thanks.